Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Thank you for downloading another episode from the Unconventional Soldier podcast, which aims to record the history of the British Army's SCA patrols unit through the voices of the veterans who served in its ranks. Today we're talking to Tim Miller, who served the tour as the battery commander of 473 Battery and was awarded an OBE for his service with the FCO as the Overseas Security Manager at the British Embassy in Afghanistan. As a slight change of pace, Tim will be talking about the Long Range Desert Group, which unfortunately only had a short history in World War II, but had a huge impact on deep penetration patrols or long range reconnaissance patrols as we know them. As mentioned in earlier podcasts, we will talk about the battery soldiers attending many courses, the International Long Range Reconnaissance School, and during the Afghan campaign, the battery, who deployed as the Brigade Reconnaissance Force, conducted the longest recorded desert patrol since World War II. No small feat. Finally, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dits, Tim's choice of book, film and luxury item. So Tim, when did you join the army and what was your journey to becoming the BC? Well, thanks Thanks for the introduction, Kev. Um, a little background, I suppose, first to get us started. Um, I went to Sandhurst in 1981 and was commissioned as a young second lieutenant in 1982 at the age of 19, the tender age of 19 at the time. I then spent my first few years with Abbott, which was a 105 self-propelled gun. I then went on to Blowpipe, a shoulder-launched air defence system, which upgraded to Javelin, um, another anti-aircraft system, but not the Javelin that people probably think of nowadays, obviously, which is anti-tank. Uh, it was the forerunner, really, to the HVM, the high-velocity um, high missile, uh, Star Streak, I think it's called now. Uh, I was also a troop commander at Junior Leaders Regiment, Royal Artillery, teaching young soldiers of 15, 16 for a year before they went to the regular army when they reached the age of, of sort of 17 and onwards. I then spent a couple of years in, in Northern Ireland before becoming a forward observer, uh, basically bringing down artillery fire, if you like. Not that I ever got to do that. In fact, I spent four months... Uh, in Saudi Arabia, just at the tail end of, of Granby, uh, about two weeks after the war finished, proper war dodger. Um, <laughs> and then I was sent to Northern Ireland again uh, as the regimental ops officer for an emergency six-month tour. So that was really my time as a forward observer. Then I was lucky enough to be uh, posted to 9-4 Regiment, the Ace Mobile Force, which was, as many of you will know, the unit that defended the flanks of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So we used to do deployments to Norway, Denmark, Spain, Italy, all the nice places, to be honest, um, which was a great, a great time, obviously. And there I was, uh, uh, I was the battery captain or second in command, if you like, of headquarters battery before taking over as one of their first adjutants when they became what was known as the force artillery. From there, I moved on to become an instructor in gunnery, where I did a year's course to learn about all aspects of field gunnery. Uh, I then went on and did a tour as an instructor in gunnery with one of the gunnery training teams up in York, teaching and, and helping units with their training uh, from a gunnery aspect. And again, got to go on quite a few manoeuvres overseas, which was great, before finally having to bite the bullet and become a staff officer in Scotland. Um, and from there, in 2000, I was posted to the battery as the battery commander, more of which in a minute. Latterly, I became a company commander at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst for a year where I trained young officers uh, ready for commissioning. And then finally, I finished as a second in command of five regiment before seeing the light and, le and resigning from the, <laughs> the army after 23 and a half years um, to become I would say I would say a proper civilian, but that's not really the case because obviously I went into private security and have spent the last 15 years now, would you believe, um, working as a private security manager in, in various guises. And you mentioned one of them, obviously, working in uh, Afghanistan for five years in, in Kabul at the British Embassy. Um, but I've obviously more action in Sevy Street, mate, uh, than you had you for did sure, in the army. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, no no doubt. Seven years in, in Iraq altogether and five years in, yeah. in Kabul. 
at times when it was was still pretty busy, I would say, to so 2005 to nine in Iraq, uh, Basra, Diwanir and Baghdad, and then out to Kabul, as I say, in the embassy from 2009 to 14, which was, was quite a busy period. And that obviously continues to this day, as we know out there. And then back to Iraq for a couple of years, which, which was a real change, actually, going back in in sort of 2015 to Iraq. It was a real change from, from when I'd first been there. Um, a lot of change down in Basra, particularly. I mean, we couldn't move down there before. Uh, suddenly you're driving around the oil fields and so on, and it was it was pretty easy going. Um, was it changed for the better then? Did you see an actual recovery? Yeah, um, no, very much so. I mean, when, when I think back to the time I was in Basra, we just didn't go out. You know, Unless you went out in Warriors, really, um, with the army, you didn't go out. Warriors being the armoured personnel carrier, obviously, that the, the army was using down there. I mean, our teams did go out. Uh, taking people from the British consulate down there round and about within the city. But there was only certain routes you could take. When I went back in 2015, I didn't really know what to expect, to be honest. Um, but we just sort of drove out in a single vehicle move from the airport. Yes, it was a, an armoured vehicle, uh, armoured Land Cruiser, but you just drove around with an Iraqi driver. And it was it just felt really strange initially. Um, but, Very exposed but, that you must have felt. Yeah, you, I did initially, but you got so used to it that it, they just waved to you. And as long as you had some water in the vehicle, they let you through the checkpoints and so on. Um, they were actually very, very friendly towards us. Um, but yeah, real change, real sea change. And, and a lot of good um, had come from it, to, to be honest. But that's oil for you, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the oil fields in the south. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose getting back to the battery, I took over the battery in Pristina, uh, in Kosovo in 2000. And sadly, uh, as the battery was coming to the end of their tour, so I didn't get the whole tour, the whole six months with them. I only really got the last uh, month or, I suppose, with them really um, and, and saw them sort of pack up, which was a real disappointment for me because obviously I'd like to have taken them over on operations. But I can't blame the outgoing BC battery commander for wanting to <laughs> obviously take the battery on operations. Um, as it happened, I stayed a little bit longer um, once the battery left, I, I was kept on by the brigade headquarters. Um, three commando brigade took over from one of the army brigades. Um, they kept me on because they were looking at a particular operation at the time. Um, and they wanted me to do some of the planning for it, which involved sort of fly paths, some photography of a specific location, as well as drawing up a detailed planning pack, um, for, for later. And as it, as it, turned out, I'm led to believe at some point they did actually use that information to successfully conclude the operation, um, which was was nice to know. But that was a nice start, obviously, because being out there on operations, you're completely focused on the guys, uh, what mm -hmm. they're doing. And so it was a good way to get to know what the role of the battery was, really, and also some of the guys and individuals. And, the, you know, a couple of anecdotal stories, I suppose, just from that short time there. We had to do a, a reconnaissance of a, a, a tall radio mast uh, to get a look from the platform at the top of it. And I have to say, I'm not, not particularly good with extreme heights. So we had to climb up the inside of this bloody tower um, in full rig with, with weapons. Um, and that was quite an experience for me, especially as my driver was right behind me. <laughs> so I couldn't sort of show any sort of fear whatsoever. And I'll never forget getting to the top <laughs> of the ladder and hanging on for dear life and trying to open this hatch at the top and climb onto this platform, which felt like it was, you know, several hundred feet high, but it was probably wasn't. But I don't think I got out of the prone position once I was on the, uh, the platform, <laughs> trying, to, trying to look out with the binoculars out to where we were supposed to be looking. I was, can't say I was un unhappy to get down from the tower, I must admit. And the second was, was obviously three commando brigade, um, the Royal Marine lot, uh, their brigade reconnaissance force took over from the battery in their role, and they, they put in an observation post line and they only lasted for 48 hours before most of them came down with diarrhea and vomiting. Um, and as you can imagine, I didn't, I didn't give them a hard time about the fact that, you know, they'd only managed 48 hours, whereas we'd done, I think the battery did two weeks in the same role, you know, without, without having any problems whatsoever. 48 hours. And they always think they the army doesn't out. wash and keep clean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, they lasted 40, 48 hours. That was it. <laughs> but... Then it was the reality of going back to Catrick. Um, as you can imagine, I, I was actually quite enjoying myself in Pristina. Didn't really want to go back to, to Catrick, but I was very lucky. I mean, I had three years in command. 
and although I didn't get to go on operations again with a battery, not through through lack of trying, believe me, um, I spent most of my time writing various papers to try and really get the equipment that the battery dearly needed. Um, as you know, it was always a battle to try and get the right equipment. Um, and dare I say, they deserved it. And, and it wasn't really until, I suppose, later when they finally picked up their Iraq tours, their Afghan tours, that they got all the equipment um, that they really wanted and needed to do the operations um, that they were required to do. But in some small way, I suppose it was a bonus that you know, all those papers got dusted off eventually and all the justification had been done. It's funny you say years. that, Tim, yeah. because I've been listening to a couple of podcasts uh, recently from ex-Hereford guys that have been on as guests on various podcasts, and they basically said the same thing. And I'm not comparing 473 battery to the SAS by any means, but I no, think the point not, across the better, Army... obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it took Iraq and Afghanistan to see proper investment across the army as a whole, yeah, inc yeah. including special forces. Yeah. Because uh, this guy was on from Hereford, and he was saying that when they started uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan campaigns, they were like the poor, ragged cousins of the American SF forces. Yeah. yeah. And uh, by the you know after a couple of years, they, they were actually getting the equipment they needed, and I think that was a reflective across the whole it, army. It, again, it's you know it's always been the budgetary constraints, I think, hasn't it? In that you know when you go on operations, you do eventually get the kit that you need to do it, but it's such a battle, and you don't get to train with the kit that you need to to train with, and that's that's the annoying part of it, I think. Um, and, and, you know, without going too much into the politics of the battery, um, we, were, we were supported by one artillery brigade. But of course, when you look at people like the Pathfinders or the three commander brigade recce force, they had their own headquarters, we were completely focused. Yeah. And they had their own budget, of course. Um, yeah. And they were, they were very reliant on, on those assets to do a specific job for the, at brigade level. Um, I'm not saying we didn't get supported, but we weren't necessarily the main focus for the for, for the artillery brigade at that time. Um, and I don't think we ever have been, to be honest, Tim. It might be right. different now, but I don't think... I think we were just this weird little unit on the side and yeah. it, people didn't really know what to do with us. Whereas yeah. if we'd been in another organisation who could take our skills and yeah. they would know how to throw them into the mix of the battle yeah. space. And, and, and like everything, and as we'll see when we talk about the Long Range Desert Group in a minute, I mean, it. you have to prove yourself. And, and I'm glad to say the battery has proven itself on operations every time. And, and that's been a real saving grace, I think, for, you know, from the, from the days in, in uh, the Balkans. Um, they proved what they could do, you know, pretty much on every single tour. Um, and then they did a lot, a lot uh, in Iraq and also Afghanistan in a similar manner, and have proved time and time again that that you know they can bat above their weight, so to speak. And and that's a huge, a huge thing, I think. And it, it should say a lot about you know the the future of the battery. I hope. Yeah. I, think, I think going back on the equipment side, though, I think if Iraq and Afghanistan were short campaigns, the equipment would have been yeah. still rubbish today, because I think it was the endurance of those campaigns. The government had to invest into it because, you know, Afghanistan was going on for like, you know, 12 yeah. plus years. Iraq yeah. was over 10 years. You've yeah. got to invest because it's a long term enduring operation. If it was, a, if it was like Granby, you would have made do with what you had, yeah. recovered, and you'd have gone back to uh, training what we had in the garages and not yeah. with future equipment. It, 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 it was interesting, actually, because I say the culmination really for me was, was, I was hoping to be a deployment with the battery on Telic One, that first operation out to, to Iraq. Um, we did conduct some planning. To that end, I had to fly out to Germany, meet with, with the first UK division. Uh, and it was, you know, it was very exciting at the time in that the battery was supposed to deploy from Turkey um, in the north of Iraq. And they were going to go forward of the line of, of, of friendly troops, cross the border, and they were going to get early eyes on, on the river up in the north. And then they were going to, watch that river basically until there was a, a, a British brigade operation to come down and secure a bridgehead. I mean, tremendous it was going to be if it had actually come off. And then obviously once the, the British had secured that, that bridgehead, the American Corps was going to drive down from the north as, as part of the whole telec operation. But as we know, sadly, the, the, the Turks uh, diplomatically wouldn't allow operations across their border. So that was, was binned. Uh, mm. But it was we, all the planning was certainly done for it. It was it was pretty exciting. I mean, I know 
at the time, obviously, UK Special Forces were already on the ground, not surprisingly, looking at, at areas for bridge crossings. Um, and we were pretty much going to go in and do a bit of a sort of relief in place, as we call it, you know, go in and take over eyes down on the on the on the river, ready for that operation. It was all going to be very much heli, um, heli borne, so moving in helicopters. It was going to be very light, uh, and then it was an armoured push push from the north. But in the end, <laughs> we were replaced in the order of battle by civilian military teams because obviously they thought the UK element wasn't going to take part in the invasion because the Americans already had most of it planned now down in the south. Mm. Um, so that northern bit was just written off. And, and of course, they thought, well, you know, Brits might have something to do later on, hence the civil military teams. But as as we all know, the Brits fought for um, their part in that initial operation and got in on it. Um, and it was a real letdown to see, because I knew that if we could stay in the order of battle, there would have been a role for us. Yeah, you know, as as it happened, the battery was able to deploy onto Telic Two, and then did, you know, numerous tours. Dare I say it as the Brigade Recce Force, Reconnaissance Force, um, in support of that. And in fact, I, funnily enough, I bumped into a number of the battery guys when I was down in Basra, um, during my time there as a as a security manager. Um, came across the battery guys doing doing their bit on on Telic, which was great. Um, but as as it usually goes, just as the battery was supposed to deploy, I got posted. <laughs> <laughs> away <laughs> to, to Sanders as a company. It was a story of my military career, as I say. But, you know, just as the operations were happening, they tended to post me. I think they just didn't want me to go out there. Um, but little did I know that, as I say, I'd spend, you know, the next, well, the rest of your life out yeah, there. <laughs> 12 years of my life in, in either Iraq or Afghanistan. But there we go. That's another another story. But, I, you know, I can quite honestly say the three years that I did spend with the battery, was undoubtedly one of my happiest tours uh, for both myself and my family as well. Um, there was many a time I used to, I had two youngsters at the time, uh, my two two boys I used to take into the, the, the battery and they were well, well looked after, usually by um, Dave, the man, um, the training guy, who'd give them money um, to get sweets and then call me dad and all the rest of the stuff that he used to do. Um, but many, many fond memories, uh, many fond memories of the time there. Um, the kids going up on the training area, climbing in and out of the observation posts and so on. Oh, it was a great time. Uh, look, look, look back on that time with, with great fondness. And I think anybody dare I say, I mean, you know, as officers, we only spend a very short time really with, with the unit. But you always look back fondly on that on that time because it's you know it's a special organisation, um, it, it really is, and you know I think all guys who've served with it who come and go from it feel the same. Um, a a yeah, great time, agree. you know. As a common thread, and we touched on it a little bit earlier on in what we we're discussing earlier, but um, we always seem to be reinventing the wheel with four seven three battery. Yeah. Certainly in my time, you know, we do one operation, we prove ourselves and it's forgotten about it. Then the next one, yeah. we're having to yeah. prove ourselves continually. Did you find yourself, Tim, that when you're BC, you're, all, you're always having to try and sell the capabilities of the battery and, and stop any v thought of disbandment coming our way? Very, very much so. You know, we were constantly trying to evolve. And as as you've, all, I'm sure, talked about already, the, the change from stay behinds to a sort of a more mobile type, long range reconnaissance type role was one example of that, but it was constant. And there were several occasions where I, I spoke to quite senior officers within the army who were saying, you know, you've, you've got to adapt and evolve. And I'll, I'll mention one later on in, 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 in the cast. You have to adapt the whole time if you've got to stay fresh. And, and in many ways, you, you become a salesman. And uh, it's funny, actually, because I've been told many times in, you know, my civilian roles, oh, well, of course, you've not got any business experience or sales experience. Well, actually, you spend yeah, yeah, the majority yeah. of your time as an artillery guy selling things. Oh, okay, yeah. money isn't changing hands, or it shouldn't be. Um, but, you know, you're justifying your role. Um, yeah. You're justifying your role the whole time in telling people what your capabilities are. You know, you turn up at a, a, a divisional headquarters or a brigade headquarters or wherever, uh, and it goes down right to the lowest level. You know, as a, a patrol commander, you turn up and they go, oh, who are you? You know, well, here's what I can do for you. And when they actually find out and when they see what you can actually do, they're like, oh, yeah, I want more of that. Can you do this? Yes, you know, we can do anything, you know, and, and that's what sells you. But people's memories, unfortunately, are very short and contained by budgets, inevitably. 
So you're constantly having to evolve and, and resell yourself. So yes, in answer to your question, you know, much of my time was spent justifying the, the battery's existence, um, particularly at, at, at one artillery brigade. I mean, luckily we had uh, a number of people in, in senior places who would also support me, which was great. But you do, you spend your whole time um, battling to, to justify. Um, and as I say, with any specialist unit, that, that's a constant problem. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was a BSM of a weapon locating battery, we went out to Iraq, went up to Alamara, and it was getting rocketed and mortared, yeah. and there's a lot of attacks in the local area. And uh, the camp RSM wanted to pull guys off my crews to put them in the Sangers. Yeah. Uh, and one of the Sanger duties was if a rocket or a mortar got fired, the sentry was to take a bearing to where he supposed it had come from. And I had to sit there and patiently explain to this person that my guy's equipment could give them a 14-figure grid yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're right, it's that salesman pitch. It, it, you, know. It's, you know, and it's not always easy to sell it to people who have fairly blinkered views sometimes, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's a constant, constant battle. Um, and that, yeah. unfortunately, as you know, comes down to the character of the individual involved at the time. You know, you have to push it quite hard sometimes. And, you know, often as not, you're told to get back in your box, but that's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll touch on that when we uh, oh, for sure. explain a bit about the LRDG. So I think before we hand over to Tim to talk about the Long Range Desert Group. I'll just summarise a little bit about the North African campaign itself in order to sort of set the conditions so people understand what the LRG, LRDG were doing at that point. I, I can help so you the out North Africa. Colin, you, you don't know what LRDG is, <laughs> I'll help you out with that. Kevin and I have real trouble saying LRDG <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just call it that unit from now on. <laughs> so Desert so, Group. <laughs> the North African campaign took place from 10th of June 1940 to the 13th of May 1943, and it included campaigns fought in the Libyan and Egyptian deserts and in Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia. And the main adversaries were Britain and the Commonwealth and the Deutsche Afrika Corps and the Italian army, and with the US joining in on 11th of May 42. So during Operation Compass, the Italian 10th Army was destroyed and the German Africa Corps, commanded by Erwin Rommel, later known as the Desert Fox, was dispatched to North Africa in February 41 during Operation Sun and Bloom to reinforce Italian forces in order to prevent a complete Axis defeat. There was a fluctuating series of battles for the control of Libya and regions of Egypt, and this reached a climax in the Second Battle of El Alamein in October 1942, when British Commonwealth forces under the command of Montgomery inflicted a, decis a decisive defeat on the Africa Corps and forced its remnants into Tunisia. And we talked about this last week. The huge artillery barrage at El Alamein was only bested by the artillery barrage at the opening start of the Gulf War, and Chris Lincoln-Jones covered that. So after the Anglo-American landings known as Operation Torch in northwest Africa in November 42, the Allies encircled several hundred thousand German and Italian personnel in northern Tunisia and finally forced their surrender in May 1943. And Tim, you know about this campaign a little bit more than me, but many people see this as the turning point of the Second World War for the British, where we had a series of a lot of defeats. We weren't very confident as an army, and I think it's probably fair to say that this was a decisive moment for Britain's confidence in, in, in the war itself. Undoubtedly. Um... I mean, my own understanding of the campaign comes really from, from believe it or not, talking to my grandfather, who served throughout the desert campaign. Um, he had joined the army at the age of 14 in India um, in the 1920s. He'd left in 1935 as a, as a uh, young soldier, and he was called up, actually, for the British Expeditionary Force in 1939. So he was at Dunkirk um, as a sergeant in the... Royal Military Police, although I like to keep that quiet, obviously. Um, <laughs> but he was a dispatch rider at Dunkirk. Um, so he he used to tell me a lot of stories about that. But he, after the, the Dunkirk, that great success of getting back to UK, he deployed to North Africa and he went through the, the entire campaign um, and told me many, many stories um, from his time in, in, in the desert, uh, which was a fascination to me, obviously, as a, as a young lad. My 
grandmother's brother as well had served in the artillery in the campaign. He was at the Battle of Knightsbridge, which was one of the, the better known battles that took place in the Desert Campaign, um, was awarded the military medal uh, as, a, as an artificer basically keeping the 25-pounders firing uh, when the artificers were still Royal Artillery wow. rather than Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. So, And he, funnily enough, he because my father couldn't be around, he uh, came to my commissioning at, at Sandhurst, uh, my Uncle Charlie, as he was known. So I grew up really um, talking about the sort of desert campaign and, and some fascinating stories about the to and fro, you know, from one end of the desert to the other and then back again and then, uh, I know my my grandfather spoke very fondly of, of Montgomery and wouldn't have a bad word said against him. And again, it depends who you speak to about about people's feelings about Monty. Obviously, some people don't don't like him, but certainly my grandfather wouldn't have a bad word said about him. And and obviously, he was held in very very high regard. I think by the the members of the Eighth Army. And you know, to a certain degree, I I think I was also a fan of 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 the command style of Erwin Rommel. Um, although he was on the opposing side, obviously, um, and it didn't necessarily go too well for him, as somebody mentioned the other day. His style of leadership was very small. Uh, he kept a very small amount of staff around him. He was very decisive, very forward thinking um, and, and a very capable officer um, in terms of, of, of his role within uh, the desert. But I think I think Monty eventually got the measure of him and and started to understand and again it's about knowing your enemy isn't it getting in the mind of your enemy starting to understand how uh, Rommel operated and by doing that was able to then <laughs> excuse the pun sort of outfox the desert fox you know uh, and and it was a great success and as you say Colin it was a turning point in 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 our campaign really i mean there was a, a lot of hard fighting still to come but once we'd taken back sort of north africa it was a real turning point because it gave us the jump off point to obviously go up into Italy. Uh, it, it enabled us to start looking at the, the Balkans and Greece and all that area, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, so, yeah, it, it was huge. And of course, opening up that front tied down so many German troops um, in, in Italy, which then enabled the whole European campaign as well. So, yeah, a, 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 a big turning point. Um, Another interesting thing about North Africa, it was of, sometimes called the Gentleman's War because it was fought outside of major urban conurbations. There wasn't really as much of the ethnic cleansing or sort of war crimes that took place, or some did take place, obviously. So, yeah, it was very much seen as a, a Gentleman's War. So we'll get back onto the, the sort of the meat of the matter. Now we've set the, the picture there of yeah. what was going on in North Africa at the time. So, Tim, just talk us through the beginnings of the Long Range Desert Group. Sure. Um, so you can understand why I've had an interest in this this unit. Um, they're an interesting organisation, and in, in, in many ways they were the forerunner of many of the, the British special units that, that followed. Um, as with the Special Air Service, it, it was the brainchild pretty much of one man, uh, a, a guy called Major Ralph Bagnold, who was a pre-war desert adventurer. So he he served in the military in the time in into wartime between the First World War and Second World War, and had spent quite a lot of his time surveying um, in the Egyptian desert, and was considered a, a sort of renowned adventurer at that time, along with with a number of his guys, and they used to basically have a few few beers in the mess and decide they'd go out into the desert, do some mapping and, you know, enjoy themselves, dare I say it. So he was actually over 40 um, at the time and, and was recalled at the beginning of the war to serve in, in Africa. Um, but by a twist of fate, actually found himself in Cairo while he was on his way out to wider Africa. And, and you know, in true army form, you're an expert in sort of the Northern Africa element, he was going to be posted somewhere completely different. Um, so where he couldn't use that experience, but that's, that's quite a common trend as we know. Um, however, during his time in Cairo, he had the opportunity to meet a chap called General Wavell, who was a pretty forward thinking officer for the time because many others weren't. Um, and in particular, there was a guy called General Henry Jumbo Wilson, um, who nearly put the kibosh on the whole thing right from the start. But luckily, Bagnold also was able to meet a guy called General Percy Hobart, uh, who was another expansive thinker. And many of you will have heard of, heard of Hobart's funnies, um, the special equipments that were used in D-Day in Europe um, to assist with the invasion force, the, the one and same same guy. So, so a very expansive thinker. 
He pushed the idea of a long-range reconnaissance group. But again, it nearly died a death because the higher headquarters weren't that interested and it was getting strangled and they didn't really see a need for it, dare I say, at that time in, in North Africa. But the saving grace was actually that Italy declared war on Britain on the 10th of June 1940. And this led to the identification of a threat to Egypt from the area of a place called Kufra, uh, which was an isolated desert post out in the southeast of, of Libya. As a result of that emerging threat, uh, Bagnall's original plan was resubmitted. Um, what he'd submitted was, was the idea of using 30 kilowatt trucks capable of op operating for three weeks, independent of supply, and with enough petrol uh, to drive out for 2,500 miles. Um, he, he planned on three men per truck, a light pilot car, which was to be used like a sort of liaison vehicle, if you like, and even a two-pounder anti-tank gun per patrol to be used for self-defense. So, you know, the realities of these, these guys are operating independently, very isolated. They needed the means to be able to defend themselves. And it's something I think that, sadly, UK forces have sometimes paid lip service to. You know, you need that firepower available to you. Um, so he, he was a realist. Um, trucks, yeah. Sorry, Tim, just yeah. to jump in. Yeah. Obviously, 1940s, a lot of vehicles were mechanically unreliable. I mean, were these trucks good in the desert environment yeah i think i from from my knowledge of them yes they were in that that obviously bagnold had experimented with various vehicles during his pre-war years so he knew the sort of trucks that he needed that could cope with the desert terrain um so he specifically went for these these 30 kilowatt trucks they also had the capacity to carry what what they needed obviously all your rations your fuel and all the water particularly obviously that goes with you uh when you go on these operations um but quite impressive vehicles actually they've got um the remains of one of them down in in the um war museum in in imperial war museum in london which has been recovered from the desert but certainly worth going down to have a look and in fact they've got a very good working version um, in the tank museum in, in Amman in Jordan, which I was lucky enough to see. And at some point, I'll send you a photo of that because I know you'll be interested. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting you, you were talking about vehicles because I remember reading somewhere that uh, when jerry cans are called jerry cans for a reason, i.e. we took them off the Germans because, if I remember rightly, the, the fuel tins that we used in the desert initially were rubbish. They were made very thin, yes. dented, mm. yep. and a lot oh, of the fuel used to evaporate from them as well. Yeah. So we, we saw the German design. Which basically, I think even the contemporary jerry cans the British Army uses hasn't changed in no. that much of a design since the Second World no. War. No, it hasn't. The other thing that that uh, Bagnold had learned from his time, obviously, was to do with evaporation of of uh, water in the vehicles as well. And he fitted condensers to the front of most of the vehicles to assist with operating in the desert um, to retain the water so it didn't evaporate away. And that was a yeah, that was again based on his experience. Um, so anyway, I suppose moving on, the plan was accepted. And Bagnall was given six weeks to raise this this force that he'd put forward. Um, so really, the Long Range Desert Group, as it became known, eventually was uh, formed between the date of 10th of June and the following six weeks in which he had to, to sort of form up the unit. So that that's really the sort of start point for the Long Range Desert Group. Um, so what of recruiting? So obviously he had a big, <laughs> a big issue ahead of him people, equipment, and so on. And most of the officers that he recruited came from his old mates from his time in the pre-war years. There was an officer called Bill Kennedy, Shaw, who was one of the first, another guy called Pat Clayton, who was 44 years old. These were not youngsters, I might add, but they were old contemporaries of Bagnold from his adventurous days. So again, he trusted them. He knew they could do what you know, what he wanted them to do. They had the knowledge. There's another guy called Rupert Harding Newman, who was from the Royal Tank Corps, and also an, an officer called Terry Mitford. Um, and one of the other issues he had before I come on to sort of how they recruited the soldiers was was getting the equipment they needed. And, and it was a real problem, as it always has been. And as you've alluded to already, with with the Brits often being the poor poor relatives when it comes to equipment, like and like all small units, um, they struggled as well. So, they used their wide network of contacts to acquire, <laughs> inverted commas, what they needed. 
And obviously, being older guys, dare I say it, they, they knew a lot of people. Um, so they and, and a lot of the people of that age, of course, were quite senior officers. So they tapped up some of their, their colleagues, old old acquaintances, and managed to acquire the equipment equipment that they needed to form this unit and obviously had the support of the senior officers as well. Um, Bagnold himself picked the troops. Uh, and interestingly, he didn't want regular troops or reservists because the, the, the feeling was he'd have to retrain them. He wanted something fresh. He wanted a clean sheet of paper, basically. Um, and he, he also didn't want the sort of, as he called them, the tough and knuckle duster men um, like the commandos either, because he, he, he didn't think they'd fit, fit the role that he wanted. Um, because remember, you know, this was a reconnaissance role initially. You, you didn't want guys who were just going to go out and, and beat things up. Um, yeah, the sledgehammer. This is ringing a bit of a bell here, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, just a, a wee bit. Um, he, he wanted intelligent, responsible, self-sufficient types who would treat their equipment um, as their own, um, as a, their life you know, could and, in fact, would depend on that equipment when they were out in, in the desert particularly, um, which is a, is a particularly challenging environment, as we know. Um, initially, he, he was looking at Australians as there was a, a historical link already with the light car patrols from World War One, but the Australian government wouldn't agree to release the men. Um, and as it happened, Jumbo Wilson, the general, was now rather more supportive. Um, no doubt, it's funny how that sort of effect happens when people are threatening your flanks. Um, and he, he chased after the New Zealanders. Um, and got in touch with with the New Zealanders. As a result, Bagnold ended up with a small number of rather tough, weather beaten, sturdy farmers of you know good farming stock, who were very technically savvy. Obviously, from having been working on farms with tractors and all the rest of it for most of their lives. Um, and and this bunch included a few Maoris as well. So they were the initial um, recruits for the the other ranks that that, that came into into the unit. I'm surprised there's no South Africans involved. Was it, was it comes it, that comes any? comes it comes a little bit later. Dare dare I say right. it? The, the South African and the sort of Rhodesian element um, does does come in, and I'll 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 come on to that. But the, you can see the sort of types he was after, and it's interesting. You you know you mentioned the South Africans with their sort of Boer background and so on. Um, they they proved to be pretty ideal as well, as you'll see as 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 we come on to that. But you can see the sort of times he was fitting the guys to the role and that I think that's so important. You know, you've you've got to be able to pick pick the right people. Um and again when you look at the there was, sorry, yeah, to, sorry, just yeah, to yeah, jump yeah, in. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Not at all. So but, but it sounds that people were selected into this unit by attributes yeah. rather than a selection course. Yeah. And, yeah, in in the initial days, yes, um, but they did start running selection, obviously, as it, as it went on, because they needed to pick the right people, and there were certain skill sets that they wanted them to have, and, and many of those skill sets was based on aptitude, rather than just you know without being funny, being able to tab, you know, long distances or whatever. Um, you needed the guys to be able to map read in the desert, navigate in the desert, which is quite a skill in itself. They needed to be very resilient. They needed to be able to cope with heat. They needed to be able to survive uh, and so on. And, and you can see the sort of characters. And, and actually, as we, we go further on, you'll see that changes as they change theatres. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate that a little bit in a minute. But initially, the, the, the group's role was primarily reconnaissance with looking at identifying the Italian desert's forts behind the Great Sand Sea. That's what they were focused on initially. And, and the first patrol consisted of two of these 30 kilowatt Chevrolets, seven hand-picked guys, along with, with Pat Clayton. And they departed from Alexandria in Egypt on the 7th of August, 1940. So not long after the formation, really. And Clayton, interestingly, took along his old driver from his pre-war year times, a guy called Ali Fadad, um, and six Kiwis, and they drove to Siwa Oasis on the 8th of August. And here, um, they joined up with seven vehicles from the Sudanese, along with an Egyptian officer who offered to ferry water and petrol through the sand sea, drop it off, and then they'd cache it, basically, much as we do. So cache being obviously hiding hiding the water, the ammunition, whatever extra supplies they needed somewhere where it could be found in the future um, for the duration of the operations. And then the Sudanese would turn back near the Libyan order, uh, border sorry, and, and then the, the uh, 
patrol itself of the two Chevrolets would would move in and go and do the task. And in fact, near near Kufra, what they did was lay up for three days. So they hid themselves with particular attention on the, the camouflage and concealment and conducted what was really the first road watch task, a term that we'll use again a, a little bit later. Um, three days of sheer boredom um, what, watching a road. Um, they, they had to conduct foot patrols over a five mile distance to actually get near the road. Um, and then on the 19th of August, they returned, having covered 1600 miles in 13 days and have it, uh, having gathered the information on Italian movements on that road, as well as useful geographical data, because obviously a lot of that, that area was uncharted properly. So they, they uh, made what we call going maps, you know, where you can go, where you can't go, what's the sand like, are there hills and mountains and so on. But that first patrol was a, was a great success. Um, and General Wavell was particularly enthusiastic. And it, it, he then, after that point, provided the strongest backing for the unit as a result of that. So they enabled themselves so, through that first operation, dare I say. So uh, during this operation, were they out of comms? Did they have any communications back to, to a base or were they just out no, on the road, just no comms at, whatsoever? At, out on, on their own. I believe they did used to have um, HF, high frequency communications, operating in a very similar manner um, to, to the way many of the units have done, you know, on Windows, um, if you can get comms, um, back to the base station back in, in Alexandria. Um, but I think it was very, very limited in terms of the schedules that they operated. Um, it was it, it was in extremis only, I think, a lot of the time, or, or literally just a check in to say, yeah, we're we're still alive and haven't been captured. Um, very, very limited. So this um, is very much a proof of concept, then. Yeah, yeah, it, that's exactly yeah. what it was, Kev. I mean, that first patrol proved that it could be done, and the information they came came back were, was extremely useful. And and straight away, obviously, the senior officers saw the the, the need for for a unit like that, um, you know, because without information which you turn into intelligence, you can do you you can do nothing. You need to be informed. So, on the back of that, they sort of structured themselves um, and formed three patrols: whiskey, tango, and Romeo patrols. And each patrol was to be twenty five other ranks, ten of the thirty kilowatt trucks the 15 kilowatt light car for liaison supplies of fuel and water for, for this 1500 miles, which seems to have become the sort of fixed distance that they were planning on. Uh, they took a 3.7 Bofors gun as well as, as, as well as four boys, anti-tank rifles and 15 Lewis guns. So again, a considerable amount of firepower. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, that, that's been a bit illuminating to me because you talk mm. about the LRGD patrols, yeah. you tend to think two or three vehicles with yeah. maybe just a couple of Lewis guns or something, but that's some quite big, important firepower yeah, they, there. They were big, big patrols, although interestingly, they, they eventually reduced it to six vehicles patrol by October because they found the 10 were too unwieldy. Um, but again, you you need that firepower because if you do, you know, if it hits the fan, and you're a long distance out in the in the desert. When you think, you know, they're doing fifteen hundred miles, you're eight hundred miles away from from your nearest help. You've got to be able to fight fight your way out. Um, and and as happened later, one of their biggest issues was was defending against air attack um, and being hounded by air patrols. Um, you know, which was really the only capability that the enemy had to to track and 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 interdict them. Um, but yeah, so they, they, they changed their size in October down to six vehicles patrol. And the unit officially became designated the Long Range Desert Group, LRDG, in October of 1940. And that's when they adopted this Scorpion badge, which, which has become very well known and synonymous with the, with the unit. And there's many, many stories around how that badge came about, which I won't go into here, but they're quite interesting to, to look up. You know, one guy will claim to have done it and, and, and so on and so on. <laughs> But after the success again of that first patrol, between October and November of 1940, um, the the U went out, they laid mines, they attacked vehicles. So they did have a direct um, assault role as well. They conducted reconnaissance, but it was very much shoot and scoot. You know, you don't hang about. Um, They conducted reconnaissance and also captured prisoners. Um, So they were pretty active. Um, And although it was reconnaissance, you know, that all those elements came into it as well. And then on the 22nd of November, they expanded the unit um, and they took on a guards patrol 
Um, why you'd pick to take on the the guards, I don't know. But you know, we won't we won't delve into that here, obviously. But um, David Stirling was a guardsman, wasn't he? I'm not even going to go there. I'm afraid. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, you're right. No, the, I mean, you know, very, very, very clear thinker. But yes, yeah, they were. A lot of them were were guards, but they took on the guards, guys. Um, they took on uh, Rhodesians and also yeomanry soldiers as well. Um, and two officers were designated per patrol. And Bagnall was not surprisingly promoted to lieutenant colonel, um, take take command of, of an ever expanding unit. And then by by June of 1941, so they continued their operations. But by June 1941, there were actually two squadrons. One was New Zealand, and one was Rhodesian. Um, they also had a, a, a headquarters signal section, a survey unit, a light repair unit, a heavy section uh, of four six tonners for logistic support. And also, believe it or not, an air section where they had a couple of light aircraft, a WACO, as it was called, and a, and a YKC, um, which was primarily for liaison and also for medical evacuation. One of the key things, obviously, when you're operating behind enemy lines to get your, your casualties out quickly if you can. Um, so yeah, it was quite a big unit. Time, they seemed to, yeah, I was about to say that. By this time, then, they've become a very capable and self-contained yeah. unit, able to more or less look after themselves with the sounds v- v- of it. Very much so. Um and, and believe it or not, in August of 1941, they actually had an artillery section as well of a 10-tonner and a 4.5-inch howitzer. And they were experimenting. Too many with, battle groups. Uh, was, I mean, it was, was, you know, I suppose they were looking at, again, what do you need to do the tasks they were being given at the time? And the 25-pounders were, were actually used successfully in an attack on a fort um, at, a, at a later date, but then was was written off and they went back more towards the sort of reconnaissance piece. But they did have a direct action role on occasions. You know, when that opportunity arises, sometimes they're in a position to have a, a much larger influence than, than you know, the, than their size. And, and they use that men, to... How uh, many at the height... Sorry, Tim. Yeah. How, how many men do you think they're in at, at its height? I think you're probably looking at, at, at in the region of sort of 200-odd people at one one point. If, if In fact, I'll come on to that <laughs> in oh, a minute. Sorry, I'm, I'm, should, no, 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 I'm not at all. I'll, I'll come on to the... Um, the complete numbers, but I mean, it was it was it was a decent sized unit, you know, two two hundred and fifty people or more. Uh, but as I say, I'll, I'll I'll give you some detail on on that on that in a minute. <laughs> but by by October nineteen forty one, um, they had ten patrols, as I say, A Squadron New Zealand, B Squadron Rhodesian, and a British and British I should say Rhodesian and British. And the unit now um, came under what was to become known as the Western Desert Force. And their role changed to a certain degree. Um, it was probably more focused, whereas they were operating more as sort of theatre operation troops before. Um, they were more in support of a specific force from sort of October 1941 onwards. Um, their main roles really were obtaining information on the enemy and their routes, um, conduct of the going recce that we talked about already, you know, how can you get in behind the enemy? Um, and, and that really came into its own uh, much later at the times of El Alamein and so on. Um, they harass the enemy uh, as well, not necessarily with sort of direct assaults, but, you know, if you could, opportunity targets came up and they were on their way back or whatever, they could hit them and run, um, you know, opportunity targets or fuel dump, for example, you know, you might want to hit a fuel dump. And also what was key was was early dissemination of the information prior to the conduct of operations, because that some of that information was absolutely vital to the Western Desert Force and the units within it to, to plan their operations. And, and interestingly, I mean, the unit expanded even more by December of 1941. They took on an Indian long-range squadron. Um, they By October of 1942, they had a Muslim and a Sikh patrol. And then in December 1942, they took on a unit known as Number One Demolition Squadron, and people better known uh, know that better as what became known as Popsky's Private Army. Um, a Polish officer who who set up his own little uh, squadron, as as officers do, um, <laughs> and and they they went on to operate widely throughout Europe as well at a later later date. And there there's a story in that in in itself. Um, there's some very interesting books about Popsky's Private Army and what they got up to. But but again, to, to sort of expand on the role, obviously it become quite a, a big unit. Um, so what were their typical sort of operations? Well, 
we've we've mentioned a few of their roles, but also they conducted a wide wide variety of other things. They ferried the brand new special air service to and from their targets because in the initial days, as as you all know, the special air service didn't have their own mobile capability. Eventually, they went on to acquire their own jeeps and so on for their hit and run. Uh, raids, but in those early days, it was the Long Range Desert Group who were delivering them to target and bringing them back again. They delivered agents as well to to rendezvous, and there's been some quite interesting stories about some of the characters that they delivered to remote places in the desert to conduct um, spy missions. They assisted the SAS in some of their raids with diversionary raids and so on, and they conducted rear area disruption. And as we've mentioned uh, already, some fort raids as well, you know, isolated forts, mainly Italian forts, uh, were sometimes attacked by the unit too, um, with some some success. But one of the better known operations and one that gets talked about um, always in conjunction with the Long Range Desert Group was what we called the Road Watch. Um, and that was considered um, as the sort of archetypal operation really for for the unit. And that consisted really of just two two pe- two men sitting about 350 metres away from a main supply route, moving into as close as 30 yards at night and reporting on all enemy movements and sending that information back. But the, the resulting information they provided had an effect out of all proportion to the commitment um, and, and became, as we've said, synonymous with the unit. Um, you know, when you talk about Long Range Desert Group, everybody goes, oh, the road watch. And there's that wonderful image of two guys sitting in a, in a, literally in a in a bit of tumbleweed by the look of it, watching a road. Um, and they they spent long periods of time doing that, um, sending that information back on all the, the movements of the Italian and German forces. And of course, that was telling them, you know, who was moving forward, what the units consisted of, and, and so on. You know, key intelligence, actually, um, for, for the Western Desert Force. Um, uh, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's easy to forget because obviously nowadays we've got imagery everywhere, satellites, air coverage, even journalists have got UAVs. Is, yeah, exactly. You know, during the Second World War, what did we have to see beyond the front and, line? And, and, and how many times have we said, uh, Kev, you know, you cannot beat eyes on the ground. I'm sorry, but, you know, yeah. eyes on the ground, people giving you information – yeah. People with a brain able to to interrogate the situation, you you cannot beat it. At the end of the day, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, um, it stands the test of time. Yeah, te- technology is great. It is, you know, but it's a system of systems, isn't it? You know, to to coin that phrase, you need all the different elements, um, and that's what gives you that real capability. Um, so in in the lead up, and we've talked about Al Alamein already, but in that lead up to Al Alamein, the unit. With with 25 officers by this stage, 278 ORs um, were the eyes and ears of the 8th Army. Um, they were the long range reconnaissance force for the 8th Army and were key to, to everything that that, that organisation did. Um, and and one, <laughs> one specific comment, actually, which will ring a few bells with you, worthy of note. Um, when the Special Air Service finally had their own Jeeps, which we talked about, they still relied on the Long Range Desert Group for their administration support, as the SES were not very good at <laughs> quartermaster matters. They just weren't interested in it, and it was always someone else's job. <laughs> and it's funny how some things just never really change, actually. You know, ad- what's the phrase? Admins for hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which, which is, I'm sorry, is very much an in-military go- a joke for those listening, but it basically means for non-specialist units. You know, they're too busy <laughs> doing the the important things to worry about administration. Glamorous stuff. Yeah, it, it, exactly. But as we know, without good logistic support, you will not succeed. Um, you'll never succeed. <laughs> which, which, dare I say it, really, you know, with Al Alamein comes to the end of the sort of desert period, um, and by. April 1943, with the great successes that the the Eighth Army had had in the desert, there was decided there was no longer really a need for the Long Range Desert Group in the Middle East. Um, so the the unit headed back once more to Alexandria, and obviously there was a lot of questions then as to what was going to happen with the unit, um, and and there was a lot of gossip and a lot of talk um, about what was going to happen. There was talk of of Greece which was obviously becoming a theatre of operations at that time with the success of the Desert Campaign. Um, that could be a possible theatre for the unit. 
Um, and, and that rumour, as all rumours, was enhanced by the fact that they started to learn um, some Greek <laughs> um, and doing some language training, always a key indicator. But in May of 1943, they moved to Lebanon <laughs> and went to the ski school there. Um, which was completely out of out of the blue, um, um, completely away from from what they were thought they were going to be doing. Obviously, with 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 Greece at the time, and and the, the then commanding officer, a guy called Prendergast, was tasked with forming small groups of mountaineers. Um, the hell of a change round in capability. Huge, huge, huge change round, and you know it, it, it's like that change, isn't it? From you know, yeah. from from stay behind OP, suddenly you're doing mobility stuff. You know, but they they had to adapt and and were needed to conduct a different role. So he was told to form up these small groups of mountaineers carrying everything they needed for for mobile patrols. And this is where really um, a selection started to come in. Um, There had to be an element of weeding because, again, the the individuals that you perhaps required for long range reconnaissance patrol in the desert in vehicles was not necessarily the same individuals that you might need for operating in a mountainous terrain. Um, There was also the problem that at this time, the New Zealand command wanted uh, most of the New Zealand soldiers back as well. Um, So they were going to lose many of of the key guys that they had. And as a result, this this weeding took place. They had to weed out out some of the weaker members. Um, They started to do a bit of a build up. They were initially doing sort of three hours in the mountains with no pack and building up to sort of two days self-sustained with 40 pounds of equipment. Um, and as we all know, it says 40 pounds, but I can guarantee they were probably having to carry yeah. uh, a lot more than that um, in reality with all the supplies and, 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 and ammunition and so on. Um, and initially, the patrols were going to be an officer and 11 men, um, but that got reduced down to seven men over time. And as, as we know, you know, you start with big patrols and they tend to tend to get smaller. Um, they become it's unwieldy. a strange number, though, isn't it? Because it is, contemporary it is patrols number. are either four or six, but just yeah. seven seems a bit random. Well, uh, again, it's like I you get an odd bud out in the limb somewhere. Showing showing my age a bit, but you know, when I go back to my time when when I was in training, sections were ten men at the time, um, or even up to twelve men. Very different, you know, the way way they operate. And then, of course, they came down to the eight man, two four man fire teams, and so on. And of I'm led to believe, and I'm a bit out of date, are evolving back. Um, to larger size sections after their experience in Afghanistan. You know, you need the firepower. Um, you you want perhaps two manoeuvre units and a fire support unit now. So suddenly you're back with 10 to 12 guys in a section. Um, again, I think, you know, patrols need to be formed depending on what the task is. You know, task organisation, I think, is the is the name of the game nowadays. You know, yeah, you have a basic unit, but but sometimes you've got a, you know, like a fighting patrol or a recce patrol, you you change the size of the organisation to sit, suit the role or task that you're going to do. Um, and the equipment, of course, that you've got to carry to, to do it. But I think there is a limit on size as well, particularly when you're operating behind enemy lines, because it can become too unwieldy and you become more noticeable. Um, inevitably, but it, but but interesting. The the commanding officer highlighted the sort of of people he wanted. Um, what he said was was he wanted those that had ideas and sympathies in common, who were friends and comrades. You know, when you as we know, when you're operating in a very small team, you need to get on with each other, otherwise thing things don't go particularly well. Um, and he listed the sort of attributes he wanted. You know, he wanted tact initiative, which would rule out quite a few people we know, wouldn't it, uh, dare I say? But, no, tact, initiative, keen, un- <laughs> keen understanding of, of, of the fellow man, above average intelligence, a sound military background, courage and endurance, perfect physical condition, obviously people like ourselves, uh, readiness to undertake um, any, any task, technical as well, because of course, you know, a lot of these roles are becoming a lot more technical than they were then. You know, the ability to operate communications equipment, um, observation devices, and as we know, as the war went on, you'd, stuff was becoming much more technical. Language skills, that ability to survive, obviously, um, and youthfulness, less than 30 years of age. I don't know what that says about the, <laughs> the rest of us, but you know, the, 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 the 40 to 50 year olds were probably not going to cope you know, in those mountains as much as they thought they could. You needed youth uh, on your side. Um, Officers uh, were to have knowledge of their men, 
and obviously to be better than their men in everything, obviously. Um, <laughs> and for all, um, a reputation for being tough was not the first choice. Um, and as as Prendergast put it, he found that you know most of those roughy tufties tended to lack intelligence, initiative, and and discipline, and and as he said, often lack courage too so it's not always those guys that you know it's not the doc savage man of bronze that you want it it's it's a guy who's who's got the aptitude and the capability for the role you've got to conduct um you know and and i think that's very telling these guys came with the experience to to know what sort of individual they needed and it wasn't always those guys that and and there were roles for those guys but it wasn't within this this unit dare i say it so there's big questions to ask, you know, as to where the unit would go. They're doing all this mounted training. Um, they're doing language training and, and et cetera. But in the end, um, they did end up in, in the Greek islands. They, they ended up in the, uh, the islands called the Dodecanese um, to seize the islands in the Aegean Sea uh, before the Germans could intervene in that area. And they found themselves operating along with the SBS at, at this time. Uh, who'd been operating in that in that region off off boats? Um, they'd taken on, as you probably know, some some of the sort of typical atypical Greek shipping, and were, were operating in and amongst the islands. Um, and the idea was that the the long range desert group would insert patrols to spy on the enemy shipping lanes, and then call in the RAF uh, to interdict. It all sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Really, yeah, I mean, you know that, that capability. But in the end. Um, okay, that was the role that they were expected to do. But in the end, they were actually required to quell an uprising on one of the islands that took place in an island called Levitha, um, which they initially, or the intelligence suggested, was a small insurrection. Um, but the long-range desert group ended up fighting hardened German mountain troops um, on that island. Um, and in this particular a action, a group of the unit was hit very hard, losing 43 men. Um, kill, wow. killed or captured and, and I know there's some some very interesting books out there which I've yet to get my hands on about that specific operation um, but I, did they, I, when they were operating in the desert Tim did they ever suffer a, a mass casualty event like that in the, yes, in the, in the desert yes they did um, usually again when they were required to do direct type actions um, you know the unit wasn't really designed and trained to do that um, and as I'll, I'll mention again later on you know so often Specialist units are taken out of role and 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 used in in ways they're not meant to be used, and it reminds me of your Sanger thing, really, in in many respects. You know, these these units are designed and trained and and equipped to do a specific function. If you, and yes, they're good guys by the very nature of the unit, but if you then take them off to do direct action, then you know, sadly, uh, it can have a fairly devastating effect. But yes, they did suffer um, several setbacks in 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 the desert. Um, doing doing such direct action operations and and they lost a few men during the fort attacks um, in some of their their major diversionary roles in support of some of the special force operations in the latter stages of the desert campaign as well they lost an, a number of people um, interestingly again in in October they found themselves under attack in Liros again one of the Greek islands where 123 of the unit became trapped by the Germans. And subsequently, believe it or not, 70 of them managed to escape um, using yeah. using their skills, again, for escape and evasion to, to, to get out. But but a lot of them weren't. A lot of them were injured. And again, I've read some fascinating stories about those those particular operations. And I'd, I'd recommend researching those um, because it, it, it's a fascinating read. Also, an element of the unit was also used in support of uh, a unit called Force 266, which was operating in the Balkans, in Yugoslavia. And I think that's where a lot of the mountain training initially was destined for. Um, and they were, were sent in there along with a number of um, SOE, the Special Operations e Executive, and also the OSS, the US version, the, the Office of Strategic Services. Um, the forerunners, really, of sort of MI6, the Military Intelligence Branch MI6, um, who were working alongside Tito's, uh, General Tito's partisans, um, in in the in the Balkans, tying down as we know a lot of German forces fighting a counterinsurgency uh, sorry an insurgency campaign against the Germans there, and the in a similar role you know doing observation passing intelligence on the the unit found itself there, and 
as the war progressed, so the CEO, the commanding officer, who by then was a guy called David Lloyd Owen, um, who again is, is has become very well known as being linked with the unit, started looking at different theatres. Obviously, the the war with with D Day, nineteen forty four. The war in in Europe was was looking towards its end, and although it went on for for quite a time until sort of mid to nineteen forty five, already in good in true you know senior officer fashion, he was looking ahead uh, as early as as July nineteen forty four to see if he couldn't push for the unit to go out to the far east um, to to fight in the in the Japanese campaign, and and indeed in November of nineteen forty four. Um, Southeast Asia Command requested the deployment of the unit and, and felt it could be be very useful, but was refused by the Mediterranean headquarters at that time, um, probably because they wanted to you know, retain that specialist capability themselves. But then in March 1944, uh, sorry, 45, a couple of, 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 of months really before the end of the, the campaign in Europe, the commanding officer went to London to argue that case again to try and get them out to the Far East. And on the 25th of May, they were told they would be transferred there. But in true military form again, one week later, there was a U-turn and it was decided at, at that stage that the Long Range Desert Group was to be disbanded. And, and a similar fate happened to the SES as well, didn't yeah, it? It did. It, it did indeed. I mean, it, a very sad finish. But again, at the end of the war, they wanted to draw everything down get over onto a sort of a peacetime footing, I suppose, you know, again, the cost of maintaining military units um, is considerable. And obviously the, the, the economy would have been suffering from the war, the post-war uh, economy needed to be thought about, and they had to try and, you know, disband as many military units as, as, as they could, um, which was a real shame because obviously the capability and as really one of the forerunners of, of special forces, um, you know, it, it, before even the SAS at that time um, in the desert, it's a great shame. I think that we lost that that capability, um, but also the identity of of, of that Yuma unit. And and in some ways, as you know, as I've, I would say, the Long Range Desert Group is really a misnomer, as as their activities went well beyond just the desert campaign. Um, like, but like so many special units, they suffered um, from having to adapt their operations to survive. Uh, and also, as we've discussed already, they were misused as elite infantry, often with disastrous results, as has happened so many times. But yeah, you know, people quickly forget. And as, as you rightly said, Colin, you know, it happened to the SAS, and it wasn't until the Malaya campaign um, that, that they had to, you know, call them back up in the form of the Malayan scouts. An A squadron, a SAS, came into being, and and it, it went on from there. Um, once it's they realised they need you- that capability. Hmm. It's interesting you use the phrase misuse elite infantry because Kev and I had a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago about this whole thing. I don't know if you've been following what's been happening with the Australian SAS. Oh, yes, I certainly and, have, yeah. yeah. One of the interesting things, that phrase was actually used in the report that they were being used as elite infantry, and but they were too small to cope with all the tours. They were doing back-to-back tours. Yeah. Guys were getting overexposed to combat. Yeah. And one of the arguments is that they were actually using being deployed in operations that a well-trained infantry unit could have done. Yeah. 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 No, I I'd, I'd agree and you can you can get into those arguments. I mean, we we've all suffered from the time when it was only, you know, special forces that could do exciting things, you know, nobody in in the rest of the army was capable of doing it it seemed. But as we know, both Iraq and particularly Afghanistan disproved that. Um you, you know, uh, units were out there uh, in heavy combat, proving that they could could do just as well as many specialist units, and and, and as we know, I think that goes for light infantry yeah, as well. Yeah, you know, before very much it used so. to be the, the remit of the powers and commandos, yeah. but you know, your traditional light infantry units proved themselves just as capable. Yeah, no, no, very very much so. And and yeah, you know, I think I think many of the special units were disappointed as well because they are a strategic asset and and they operate on very high level strategic intelligence. Um, yeah, let's let's keep them to what they're good at. They're specialists. They're trained for that, um, and and I suppose we're seeing it now with the formation of the special forces support group, you know, um, and taking a, a line parachute battalion out of the line and making them a specialist unit, um, one para, and obviously then combining with the Marines and those those other extremely well trained unit, the RF regiment. 
<laughs> which which I won't say any more about because my father was in the RF regiment, so I better better keep quiet before before you get too many complaints about your podcast. Well, 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 we, might, we might get a comment. Or yeah, you're on gonna that. you're gonna know. No, my father was in the in the RF regiment. Dare I say it? So I I feel I'm in a oh, position to comment for a few years. To well, is there is there any surprise? <laughs> <laughs> no. no, so moving moving quickly on before I drop you in any more, um, you know, deep doo doo as uh, we would say. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's a common problem, isn't it? Um, I, I'm of, of the view that there'll always be a place for specialist units, um, and if only the powers that can be can see the considerable benefits that the benefits that come from them. Um, there are huge more the force multiplier, um, well beyond I think the size of the unit. Um, as the battery has proved time and time again on, on operations. And as ever, I think people are suspicious of those that want to be special or use the name special. Um, and they're inevitably in the minority. And so often senior officers, you know, see it as a draw on what is is increasingly a limited resource. Um, and they're always in short supply. And of course, often as not, those specialist units draw on some of your best people. Um, and they're not the people you want to be losing from your your unit, um, and that's always going to be a problem. I think it's funny as you say that. I've been listening to this historian James Holland who does a podcast with Al Murray, the comedian, and he was talking about airborne. Uh, sorry, uh, Allied airborne forces during World War Two, and he yeah. touches a bit on what you said there, Tim, in yeah. that. They took away a lot of really good people, but his argument is that airborne forces, when they did deploy in operations, their, their operations were really the success that people envisaged. Yes. And he, he also saying that one of the problems you have is you have this highly elite unit being delivered on target by some of the least capable pilots in transport command. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, exactly. And that was one, one of the reasons a lot of the drops went haywire yeah. because you know they didn't have enough transport left yeah. the pilots weren't very good yes you know and it's an interesting counter argument to it to it. It, it is interesting and it, it, it reminds me of the fact you know one point we were looking at different insertion means because obviously when i was the the battery commander we were looking at, at different ways of of being able to deploy the unit yes helicopters are ideal they're not always available mobility is another means but also you've got parachuting as a means. Yes, it's very specialist, but how specialist? Yeah, you've got pathfinders who do free fall. Free fall is very specialist, obviously. And there's a training burden that comes with it. But I I did look at the use of, of parachutes as an insertion means. I mean, the British military tends to be very protective over that parachute capability. Or should I say, really, the parachute brigade tends to be very protective. And and as I discovered, that comes down to budgets, dare I say it. Um, because actually, if you if you look at it, parachuting is just a means of getting you on the ground. Um, and I think we forget that the whole idea behind things like P Company um, and the specialist training that they do is about uh, imbibing the, the para ethos within those individuals that are going to um, deploy with the parachute brigade. Um, and fine, you know, commandos go off and do their jumps. They don't need to do P Company because they've done an arduous course. And that was my argument in that, you know, if you look at the battery, we were doing a, an intensive selection course. You know, all we wanted was a parachute capability. We weren't saying we wanted to serve with the parachute brigade. We didn't need that ethos. What we needed was just a means of getting on the ground. Um, like, dare I say it, the Americans tend to have a, a slightly different view. You know, if you need to learn to parachute, you learn to parachute. You know, that doesn't mean you're going to be a paratrooper. It doesn't mean, you know, their ethos is about being able to jump behind enemy lines and, and hold on for a period of time you know, under arduous conditions without resupply until somebody links up with them. That's what their ethos is about. Um, for us, it was about getting a small team onto the ground behind enemy lines un, undetected. Now, that could be through not necessarily the sort of high altitude, low opening, which is a very specialist capability, but things like steerable chutes, um, steerable parachutes, um, and what we call high altitude, high opening, that's a capability we you know, perhaps could have used. And it, it, the training burden is not that difficult. But what I really came up against at the time was budgets, because there's a limited budget for the para battalions to do jumps. And if we had got been given that that role, it would have taken money away from them, pure and simple. And nobody else, of course, was willing to stump up the money to train us in that capability. 
Um, and this was the constant, you know, it illustrates one of the constant battles. And, you know, did we need parachuting? Probably not, but it would have enhanced our capability. And, and at the time, again, uh, uh, you know, of interest, we were training our detachment commanders course for our, our, our patrol commanders was alongside the Pathfinders, alongside the three commando brigade recce force. And I remember going down to visit our guys doing exactly the same course with those guys. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we were sitting there going, well, you know, why can't that unit combine? It would have been sensible to put that capability together. you got all these specialist trained guys who are doing the same sort of roles with different insertion means. So again, you know, Brigade Recce Force was an amphibious force. Pathfinders was the Halo course. In many respects, the battery was the mobility element. And you could have brought them together as a unit. Um, and, and she, you know, there would have been an economy of effort and so on. But, of course, 3 Commander Brigade, 16 Air Assault Brigade, very protective because that was their reconnaissance capability. And to take that away from them <laughs> was, a, was a big no-no. Um, but there you go. Sorry, I've I've gone off down a rabbit hole there. But um, no, that's fine. No, 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 just, uh, I think what you're talking there is just to really wrap it up. Your, your last thoughts on on the evolution of a unit, really. Um, yeah, uh, I mean the one one thing that sticks with me, I think, is is there's a an individual called General Cedric Delves, um, incredible uh, individual, um, who served with the Special Air Service. Um, certainly during most of the Amani campaign and so on. And he was he was one of the generals when I was in command of the battery. And I'll never forget him talking to us. I think it was in Oman when we were doing uh, Exercise Safe Syria um, in, in sort of 2001, uh, at the end of which was, of course, the whole 9-11 thing. And I remember sitting in the, in the, in the desert in Oman at the, the tail end of that exercise, um, watching the 9-11 thing happen. And he said... Um, at a briefing, he said, look, you know, it, it's rare on operations that any unit actually carries out the role that it was trained for. And you have to adapt to survive. Um, and believe it or not, my experience now of being in, in the civilian world and in the business world, you have to do the same in business. You evolve or you die. Um, and I, I could bore you to death on, on business, but I won't. That's that's a story for another day. Um, but it's so true. You must evolve. You've got to adapt and you've you've got to think ahead. Otherwise, as a unit, you will die. And and if there was one message I'd give to, you know, the battery going forward, constantly be thinking about evolving. But you dare I say it, you need people in high places to ensure that yeah, you survive support you. and support you. Um, so getting some of our people into more senior roles is 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 critical. It really is. So I just want to finish off with one question. It might be impossible to answer, Tim, because <laughs> it'll be maybe a bit like comparing apples and pears. Yeah. But out of the SES and the LRDG, I Ooh. managed to say that correctly there, Kev. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so who do you think was the most professional? <laughs> Put you on the spot there. You, you or have, is that a question it, that just... No, no, no it, is, it is a bit apples and pears because, again, if it comes back to what was the unit designed to do you know mm -hmm. the long range desert group were a very professional unit in my opinion um and very capable at what they did um but in the same stroke the SAS were very good at what they did um their their role was direct action you know and you look at the success they punched well above their weight and made a huge difference to um the desert campaign as did the Long Range Desert Group in their own way. You know, the intelligence that the LRDG provided was what often the SAS operated on. You know, so you, you've got that, the, the two very different capabilities, yeah. information gathering to form intelligence on which you can then take action, whether that be specialist action or, or in fact, more sort of conventional action. Um, you know, everything is based on intelligence <laughs> again i, I draw just thought i'd put you on the know. spot mate no, but thanks for that anyway <laughs> but, but obviously i'd go with the lrdg <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sure you get a few well. complaints about that as well but you know <laughs> I can't wait to see the comments on that one <laughs> it, 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 very very yeah, apples you know, and pears apples and pears yeah, it, very it, different. It, and, it, and at the start as well where yeah you're going to make loads of mistakes i, uh, I, th and, I think what's most interesting is is how those units came about. If you look at both those yeah. units, they came about with clever ideas from clever individuals who pushed and pushed 
and networked to make it happen. And it was the units themselves that then proved themselves and their capability that enabled them to survive. Um, and you'll always have the naysayers about specialist units. Um, and your halls has the great supporters of specialist units. Um, but I, you know, personally, uh, you know, I, th I think we need them. I really do. You know? Well, thanks so much. <laughs> and thank you for your comments that are racing towards us as we speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> can't wait to deal with those. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, as usual, we're going to finish off with our Desert Island of Dicks, which is the guest pick of a favourite book, a film and luxury item. So, Tim, what are your choices? So, obviously, I've only recently learned to read. Um, but <laughs> now the book, book I'd recommend is, is Undercover War. Uh, it's a book by a guy called Harry McCallion, who is an interesting uh, character in his own right. And I'd, I'd recommend that, that people look him up. But it's an, an excellent insight into covert operations in Northern Ireland. Uh, in much more detail, I think, than, than many of the other books I've read on that subject. Um, there, there's some other good books out there, but this one really brings it to life. And I think because of Harry McCallion's background, um, he, he's able to do that from the perspective of somebody who has actually been involved with that. Um, and I was he thoroughly, a character? Yes, he was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, he among, became a barrister uh, for him. Yeah, rightly. amongst other things. Yeah, very yeah. interesting character. Um, definitely, definitely worth worth a read. Um, but yeah, it really goes into quite a lot of, uh, a lot of detail about the sort of covert operations that were 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 being conducted in Northern Ireland um, uh, in those busy days. Uh, but yeah, thoroughly recommend that. Very good read. And your film? Uh, the film that was a that was a really hard one because obviously I there's so many different films they're all tend to be war related but the one that really always jumps out at me is where eagles dare it it's an old film i know um but you know with with the age that i am i grew up on it you know in in the in the 70s that that every christmas you know you watch where eagles dare um it was almost forced viewing but it was great um broadsword colin danny it, boy it, classic it, line it, it, exactly you know and a, a great film um, it, it really was, I think, well ahead of its time um, in, in those days, and it, and it it sparked my interest in in all things military. You know, you're like, oh, I want to be doing that. Yeah, and it was all the exciting bits, isn't it? Of 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 you fighting know, what, on a cable car. Exactly. You know, I mean, you know, obviously, we all want to train in that. <laughs> it did, didn't have any sanga bashing at all, because that's what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> or waiting on in the south <laughs> smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there may have been a bit of that. Or two in areas. <laughs> or two in areas. Three leaves. leaves. Yes, indeed. But no, we, mm. where he goes there, what a fantastic film. Really was. Your luxury. Oh, that, that was quite an easy one, actually. And it's it's one of the first things I bought actually out here in, in, in Dubai, where I am at the moment. Uh, my Bialetti Mocha Express. Um, because, as we all know, coffee is just so important. Um, it, it's a little pressure cooker. You use it on a gas stove. You grind your own coffee beans, and it. it Have you it heard yourself? Where's it all gone wrong? Well, it's just, it's just you know, <laughs> honestly, I mean, you could not survive without that. You, you need look them up. That's all I'll say. And when you've tried coffee made in a Bialetti Mocha Express, then we had Lee Chapman that. on one of the pods recently, mate, and he picked something similar. <laughs> and he's been commissioned, so I think it's an officer it, thing it, for sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sitting on my side as we speak there it's it. <laughs> Colin so, you book for this for this period yeah I can't do any Ponzi coffee I'll just give a book this week so <laughs> my recommendation is a book called My Friend the Mercenary by James Brabazon who's a British journalist and in 2002 he went out to Liberia to investigate the war there and he actually embedded himself with the guerrilla forces and I often admire people that go out and do this sort of stuff because I think with your military knowledge, you can have too much information and we'd, we'd over plan it and overthink it. He just went out there. Uh, but he did hire himself a close protection guy who was a guy called Nick Detroit, a former South African defence soldier who'd fought in conflicts across that continent for 30 years. And the first three quarters of the book deals with the rebel war 
uh, and the, the insurrection they led against government troops led by Charles Taylor. And it really gets to grips with the chaos of Africa, the whole mix of warlords, mercenaries, rebels and corrupt officials. And as ever, it's the, the normal African people that suffer. Uh, he saw some pretty horrible things and he was in a bit torn between was he there to film what was happening or was he causing some of the incidents just by being there and he suffered from PTSD when he got back and the last quarter of the book is really about he investigates his friend's Nick's uh, part in a coup in Equatorial Guinea it's a really really good book a really interesting read and highly recommended so what's yours Kev? Mine's uh, The Jungle is Neutral by F. Spencer Chapman. Um, real, really great book. Um, talks about his time at the time with, uh, um, fighting the Japanese in occupied Malaya, uh, how he travelled through the jungle when he was captured by the Chinese, when he was captured by the Japanese. It's a proper boy's own story because prior to uh, being in the forces, he was an adventurer, a uh, traveller, and, you know, he was awarded DSO and Bar during the war, but he was also awarded the Polar Medal for one of the expeditions he was on before the Second World War. And Field Marshal Earl Wavell wrote about him, saying Colonel Chapman was has never received the publicity and fame that his predecessors lost, referring to T. E. Lawrence. But for sheer courage, endurance, physical and mental, the two men stand together as examples of what toughness the body will find if the spirit within is, is tough. And as very worthy representative of our national capacity for the individual enterprise, which is hope that even the modern craze for regulating our lives in every detail will never stifle. So it's a it's a fantastic story, and there's a follow-up book which I've just picked up, which I might mention on one of the later podcasts about this man. But his his book was adopted, I think, by the Foreign Legion as uh, a guide to jungle warfare, and, but based on his experiences. And he mentioned stay behind all pee parties in it as well. Yeah, well, didn't he, he? he did a little bit with uh, Force One Three Six, which is an SOE type force. It was left behind. Uh, did stay behind while obviously watching the Japanese convoys and shipping and such like. And he was he was captured with some members of Force One Three Six as well. Um, but he, yeah, again, a fantastic story of. Again, I mean, I, I say this every single time, that the 14 Army and the campaign in the Far East was sometimes, um, it's never had the recognition perhaps the European campaign got. Okay, so we're coming to an end now. So, Tim, thanks for coming on, mate. Much appreciated. That was a great summary of the LRDG, and I've managed to say it twice in a row now without getting the initial <laughs> thank, mixed up. Thank you both for letting me come on. Excellent. And also thanks to the listener for your continued support and suggestions. And as ever, you can get in touch with us at our email address, which will be at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us on all the usual social media suspects, including Instagram and Facebook. And again, links in the show notes for that. And if you've downloaded us from iTunes, please give us a review. Finally, our thanks go out to Nick Beale for sponsoring the series and offering technical support through his company, ISAR. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. Mm-hmm.